1847, as we know, was a terrible year for Irish famine migration, and thousands came to Bytown. Um, and hundreds of those have died mostly from typhus fever. Elizabeth Pierre had set up a temporary hospital to care for them, and uh, unfortunately, hundreds of them died. Elizabeth Breer kept the names of all her patients and she personally uh, drove a wagon with the pine coffins and with some other sisters helped bury them right here. So this is the early cemetery in Ottawa and this is where all the Irish famine victims are buried. Close to 400 of them. And today it's a city park called McDonald Gardens. But back then it was the Catholic cemetery. So that's why we're holding a commemoration today to honor the memory of those who cared for them and to honor the memory of those who lie buried here. We've got uh, memorials in Gros Eel where there's five and a half thousand buried. Uh, we've a memorial only an hour away in Cornwall. There's a Celtic cross. Uh, there's a Celtic cross in Kingston. At all these locations we have mass graves. We've got mass graves in uh, Montreal and in Quebec. So I think it would be very appropriate to have a, a monument here. Gia diva carja, agus felcha huig ser manus quiv na hon an gort amor eran la eran aksha. Good morning, my friends, and welcome to the Irish Famine Remembrance Ceremony on this very Irish day. Bonjour, chers amis. Bienvenue à cette cérémonie en souvenir de la grande famine irlandaise en ce journée très irlandaise. My name is Nora Pat Marshall of the Irish Senior Social Group of Ottawa, and I'll be your MC for today. Je m'appelle Nora Patricia Marshall du groupe social des seniors irlandais d'Ottawa, votre maître maîtresse de cérémonie aujourd'hui. We begin by acknowledging that we are here on unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Commençons en nous rappelant que nous sommes ici sur le territoire non cédé de la nation Algonquin Anishinaabe. Kevin Dooley is an Irish immigrant, author, musician, and heritage activist. He will now open the ceremony with an Irish lament. <laughs> Casu Abanam Shiva Mavora She on on scale on ta and sha na on on Bakteras Agus and Kurkas Nadina here in Ergin Tom Shinak and Gurta Moor. Agus could it's on scale it's could it's more than Nadini Hang and Sha Grish Grail Gore Eid. This is a lament that was that's called Shiva Mavora, the cause of my sorrows, about the penal laws and the structure in Ireland that led to the destruction of the people and led to incidents like the Great Famine. And it's, it, it, we do know that the majority of the people who came here at the time were Gaelic speakers. So we're not an English speaking race, and this, this was their language. So here's a, a, a lament from the 15th century that took right through the whole of that, uh, that, that story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
of Maya go to Kevin. Uh, maintenant, nous accueillons Sir Rachel Wattier, Supérieur Général des Sœurs de la Charité d'Ottawa. Now let us welcome Sister Rachel Wattier, Superior General of the Sisters of Charity of Ottawa. We are starting off with a prayer this morning. Nous commençons par une prière ce matin. Seigneur Jésus, ici reposent les restes et les semences de ces nombreux immigrants irlandais qui sont décédés des suites du typhus de 1847 et de la famine. Pour Mère Bruyère, ces immigrants irlandais étaient tes amis, Seigneur Jésus, et ils avaient besoin des soins et de la compassion, alors qu'ils étaient seuls, loin de leur patrie et malades. Mère Bruyère leur a montré ton visage de bonté à ce moment important du passage de cette terre à celle de l'au-delà. Nous savons que tu les as accueillis dans ton royaume, et qu'ils jouissent de ta béatitude. Nous savons aussi que tu as accueilli ta servante Elisabeth Bruyère, qui a été un reflet de lumière et de réconfort à ce moment critique de notre histoire, à des milliers d'immigrants en quête d'un œil compatissant et d'une main secourable. Répands sur nous, qui sommes ici, ta bénédiction. Que nous soyons à notre tour des porteurs et des porteuses d'une compassion sans frontières. Que ces personnes qui reposent ici trouvent paix et repos. Ce qu'ils ont été demeure un témoignage et un héritage de courage. Lord Jesus, here lies the remains and seeds of those many Irish immigrants who died as a result of the typhus of 1847 and the famine. For Mother Briere, these Irish immigrants were your friends, Lord Jesus, and they needed care and compassion as they were alone, far from their homeland and sick. <clears throat> Mother Briere showed them your face of kindness at this important moment of their passage from this earth to your afterlife. We know that you have welcomed them into your kingdom and that they enjoy your beatitude. We also know that you have welcomed your servant, Elisabeth Briere, who has been a beacon of light and comfort at this critical time in our history to thousands of immigrants seeking a sympathetic eye and a helping hand. Bestow upon us who are here your blessing. May we in turn be bearers of boundless compassion. And may these people who lie here find peace and rest. What they were remains a witness to your love and a legacy of courage. Grand merci, ma soeur. Thank you, sir, Watier. Maintenant, quelques paroles du père Robert Laroche, Obla de Marie Immaculée, récemment nommé curé de la paroisse Saint-Joseph de la Côte de Sable. We will now hear from Father Robert Laroche, oblate of Mary Immaculate, the new pastor of St. Joseph's Parish in Sandy Hill. Well, good morning to all of you. Um, I was asked at the last minute to uh, replace someone, so uh, I don't know too much of the history, but I was asked to write a prayer uh, for this special occasion. And I wrote it on paper from the 1840s. So it's a little old paper, but it works. <laughs> Almighty and eternal God, 
hear our prayers for your sons and daughters of this Irish famine of 1847 and the illnesses that they've suffered, whom you have called from this life to yourself. Grant them light, happiness, and peace. You have called them to pass safely through the gates of death and now live forever with your saints in the light of your, um, you promised to Abraham and to all the descendants in faith. Guard them from, from all harm and on that great day of the resurrection and renewal, raise them up with all your saints. In your faithfulness, grant them eternal life in your kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Um, I wasn't aware I was supposed to have it in French as well, but that'll do for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Father Roche. Le Reverend Tim Cahill, prêtre titulaire à l'Église anglicane de Saint Thomas l'Apôtre, va nous adresser la parole maintenant. Reverend Tim Cahill, the incumbent priest at St. Thomas the Apostle Anglican Church is going to say a few words to us now. Merci tout le monde et uh, bonjour mes amis. I am uh, Tim Keel, I'm an Anglican priest, and I am the uh, descendant and very proud Irishman of uh, refugees who came here from Ireland to the Ottawa Valley on the Quebec side in the 1840s. As I read this uh, litany for the Irish famine and refugees, I invite you, if you feel so moved, to join in the refrain with me, we remember, we give thanks. For the Irish women, men and children who came among us, starving and impoverished, victims of disease and colonial indifference, risking all for freedom in a land they knew not, our ancestors whose memory we carry, may their pain and untimely deaths be not forgotten. We remember, we give thanks. For Elizabeth Briere and ses Sœurs de la Charité, the Oblate Fathers, physicians and ordinary citizens who with unfailing courage extended the hand of welcome and healing to strangers bearing deadly disease and misery. We remember their heroism, their compassion, selflessness and humanity. We remember, we give thanks. For those Christians of other churches who ministered to the sick and dying and labored alongside the sisters on the front lines of the epidemic, crossing sectarian lines that divided communities in their day, we honor their courage. We remember, we give thanks. And may we, in our time, be inspired to welcome the stranger and vulnerable among us standing against fear, prejudice, and indifference to build a more just and more caring community where the common humanity of all is respected and fostered. We remember, we give thanks. This we pray in the many names of the all-merciful and compassionate Creator. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father Kehoe. Veuillez accueillir maintenant Son Excellence le Dr. Eamon McKee, ambassadeur irlandais au Canada. Et je pourrais ajouter un, his un historien, un historien brillant. Please welcome His Excellency Dr. Eamon McKee, the ambassador of Ireland to Canada, and I might add, a brilliant historian. <laughs> Uh, bienvenue à tous. 
and uh, uh, Kate Mila Falter Galair, thanks very much everybody for, for coming here. It, it's great to see such a, a turnout on a, I think, almost a soft Irish day, although it threatens to become a bit more than that. But anyway, thanks for being here, it's great. Um, I want to thank Pat Marshall, our MC, who's doing a great job. I want to recognize James Maloney, chairman of the Ireland-Canada Parliamentary Friendship Group. He's a champion in all things related to Irish heritage. Um, I want to acknowledge too uh, Sister Wadie uh, and, and the other sisters here who come as representatives of a great tradition uh, of compassion which was on display uh, heroically in, in 1847. Uh, Father Laroche, uh, who couldn't make it, but the representatives here of the Oblate Fathers who equally were heroic. Uh, Reverend uh, Tim Kill, thanks so much for, for, uh, for your contribution. Uh, Kevin, for your very evocative lament. Uh, uh, and to both of them for their for their gift of, of music and words. Um, Mark McGowan, the professor uh, from St. Michael's College, is also here. I don't know where Mark is. Where's Mark? There's Mark. Mark is a fantastic uh, historian of the Irish in Canada. Uh, he's also been a champion of the story of the famine and the famine Irish in Canada. Uh, he has delved deeply into the records of the Strokestown tenants uh, and their journey, uh, which is emblematic of the hundred, hundreds of thousands who came here from Strokestown House through Liverpool, Grosseal and on to, to create lives in Niagara. Um, I want to pay a particular thanks to our local historian, uh, Michael McBain. Michael has written uh, a brilliant book on Bytown, uh, 1847, and the role of Sister Bruyere in helping the Irish famine immigrants who made it here. It's, it's a really wonderful book, and that really is where this journey that has brought us here today started. Um, so I read the book, and I met Michael, um, and like so much, I, I was very surprised at this story because I hadn't really been aware of it. Um, and one of the surprises of my posting here is the degree, the depth of Irish heritage in Bytown, Ottawa. So myself and Michael talked about that. He's also written a wonderful book on, um, on uh, the, uh, John Egan, uh, another great Irishman uh, who was here in the 1840s. Um, and because of him, I did a little tour around, uh, including to the hospital established by Sister Bruyere, I cycled up here and I saw the sign saying that all the bodies had been moved, all the remains had been moved to Beechwood. Um, and then Michael set me right. He said, no, they're not moved. Um, and that was a big surprise because um, myself and my colleague Sally here in July had gone up to Gros Eel. And it, we had a wonderful ceremony there. There's a common grave, about five and a half thousand Irish famine immigrants in Gros Eel, beautifully done by the local Irish society up there. Uh, Irish Heritage Quebec um, with Parks Canada, fantastic job. So to come here and then realize actually literally where we stand are um, possibly, well many hundreds but possibly thousands of remains of the original settlers in Bytown, but with them probably about 300 uh, Irish famine victims, some of whom, but only some of whom, were moved in the 1870s. They were moved if they were claimed and if you could afford to move them. Um, and so uh, when, I, when I heard this, uh, and having come from Gros Eel, I said to Michael, why don't we uh, organize a commemoration, uh, which is what's happening today. And I have to applaud Michael for all of the energy he's put into organizing this event. We're here and we call, we deliberately call this event Commemoration and Remembrance because what we're doing is we're commemorating all of those people who helped the Irish uh, when they made their way here. Now don't forget the Irish had crossed the Atlantic uh, essentially as ballast on ships uh, in horrible conditions. We think maybe about 5,000 died on the passage, probably a lot more. If there was any sign of typhus or what they call ship's fever, they were stopped at Gros Eel. Uh, horrible conditions there despite the heroic efforts of the station master who subsequently committed suicide because he had seen such horrible things that summer um, then they then moved on through to uh, Montreal where we have a common grave 
and look, the uh, representatives here from Montreal and the Black Rock common grave there, possibly five to 6,000 remains. Uh, we have uh, thousands of remains in Quebec at Point St. Charles. Um, only an hour down the road in Cornwall, there is a Celtic cross to commemorate uh, a, a common grave of about 50 victims. We have them in Kingston, Toronto, and now we have here uh, in Ottawa uh, another uh, area to be commemorated uh, regarding the Irish famine victims. So um, the heroism I think we have to underline as well because back in those days they did not understand the nature of the disease. So you were literally taking your life in your hands when you were helping these poor Irish who were coming in their thousands to Bytown. And Sister Bruyere with her less than 20 nuns, some of them teenagers, some of them from Ireland, uh, helped these people uh, and helped them survive. Uh, the Oblate Fathers equally took great risks. Uh, we had volunteer women um, and um, we had, the, for example, the emigrant agent uh, George Burke as well helping. All incredibly heroic people that we want to remember and commemorate today. But it's also about remembrance. It's about the people who fled here from Ireland in 1847. Now, there's a lot of talk in Ireland and a lot of discussion historically about how the famine started. And a lot of historians and commentators would say it started in 1845 with the failure uh, of the potato crop. But in reality, the famine begins in 1800, when the British government uh, suspends, abolishes our parliament. And from 1800 onwards, Ireland's neglected. It plunges into the worst poverty in Western Europe. Uh, Dublin immediately declines, the economy declines, the agriculture declines, and it coincides with a rise in the Irish population. Um, <coughs> which had suffered in the previous wars of conquest and, and wars of religion. But as the population is growing, the economy is sinking. Now, only in, only in Ireland was this regarded as a disaster. In every other Western European country, a rising population was regarded as a good thing. It was a good thing for the economy. The difference was that those countries were sovereign countries and Ireland was a colony. And in a colony, a rising population was regarded as a danger. So when the famine came along, uh, the imperial authorities in London saw this horribly as a solution. Um, they give some assistance in 1845, 1846, but then they suspend that assistance um, because they want to move the population um, and they want to correct the population and they don't want to upset the economy. So they still export food. This realization uh, in the winter of 1846, early 47, spreads panic amongst the Irish. They realize help is not coming. Um, but to get to America is expensive, uh, but the British allowed them to get on what are essentially lumber ships, packed onto these lumber ships to leave. And of course they came to Canada because London controlled the immigration policy. So whatever way we look at the causal origins, we have to go back and understand that it is essentially an outcome of colonial policy. Um, but what it did do was it advanced the cause of Irish independence, but it also advanced the cause of uh, confederation in Canada because Canadians realized that they actually were at the receiving end of a solution for, for uh, the British in Ireland, as it were. And so it did generate a huge debate. But in remembering the people who died, I think we also have to remember the tens of thousands of people who survived and who made lives in Canada and made a huge contribution to Canada. So while we remember the people who are literally buried under our feet here, and they deserve to be remembered. We also celebrate the great story of the Irish in Canada. Uh, and we have uh, to thank as well all of the Irish societies that have protected and defended all of the sites where the famine Irish are buried. It's thanks to them, uh, for example, in the 1990s, when there was discussions about the future of Gros Isle, it's thanks to them that Gros Isle is what it is today. It's thanks to them we have a Celtic cross in Kingston and a Celtic cross in Cornwall. And obviously there's some work for us to do here in Ottawa to revive that memory of the disaster of 1847, the greatest humanitarian disaster to, to afflict Canada, uh, and to celebrate the story uh, of the Irish uh, in, in Canada. So uh, thank you all for, for coming. Thanks to everybody who made this possible, my colleagues in the embassy. And uh, we look forward to building on this event today to properly uh, memorialize uh, what this site uh, represents. Uh, and the people that are here, and we remember them. Gurmila Mahagud, thank you.
God of Mille Maiga Tahinen. James Maloney, député de Toby Coke Lakeshore et président du groupe interparlementaire Canada Irlande, nous adressera maintenant la parole. James Maloney, Member of Parliament for Etobicoke Lakeshore and Chair of the Canada Ireland Interparliamentary Group, will now speak to us. Um, let me, I am a politician. I'll try to speak loudly so everybody can hear me. Um, I find many times when I begin speaking more people move to the back so they can't hear me and, and as a politician people either don't want to hear what you have to say they don't like what you say in either case they don't believe it so it doesn't matter but but it's today is different today is very different and I'm, I'm truly honored to be here uh, I came in from Toronto for this event because of its significance of its importance and the people who are here today know why that is the case but the purpose and me being here and the purpose in a lot of the things I do as a member of parliament is to make sure other people learn that and understand it and appreciate it. You know, I talk about uh, Canadian history. I talk about Irish Canadian history. Well, Irish Canadian history is Canadian history. You look across this great country we live in and there are Irish footprints everywhere. There are Irish fingerprints on every piece of significant infrastructure in every town and every village and every city in this country. Last week, just last week, this weekend, I was sitting around a campfire with a, a friend and she was telling me about her grandfather who came to Canada in the late 1960s and he was in the construction industry and one of his proudest moments was laying the last piece of marble on the top of First Canadian Place in downtown Toronto and how much that meant to him, and how much it means to her. And those are the kind of stories that need to be passed along and shared with, with others. Look, my own story is, is a happy one. I come from the, I was born in Thunder Bay, but my ancestors come from the Ottawa Valley. They moved, there was three Maloney brothers who moved here in about 1840 and settled in Mount St. Patrick, uh, helped start that parish. The, the positive stories about the Irish contribution in Canada are extensive. Uh, people know who Darcy McGee is, especially in this town. Every Canadian knows who Thomas Darcy McGee is. Every person knows who Daniel O'Donoghue is, who started the Canadian Labour Movement. I learned yesterday about a man named Thomas O'Hearn, who was an instrumental part of building the city of Ottawa. He brought electricity to the city of Ottawa, and he drove the first electric vehicle. This guy was a hundred years ahead of his time. It was an Irishman who did that. That's not to be overlooked. And I say that only half in jest. These, these are the stories that need to be told because people truly don't remember them or know them. People like myself who were born here, you're proud of your Irish history, but you don't necessarily know why. And that's why today is so important. And I want to thank Michael McBain, Mark McGowan, and particularly Ambassador McKee. My father-in-law who comes from Dungarvan in Waterford always says to me, you know, it's never a bad day, Jamie, when you learn something new. Well, when I'm spending time with Ambassador McKee, it's about every 15 minutes. I can't keep up with the information he shares with me. And I'm not kidding. He said he's a great reader and a great historian. It's, it's, it's overwhelming, but I appreciate it so much. And we should all be very, very grateful for the, for the work that he is doing in this event today. Because these three gentlemen, they're examples of the modern-day storytellers. And these are the stories that need to be revealed and shared with so many people because uh, I have colleagues who have heard some of these stories they didn't know before and I include myself in some cases and they're overwhelmed they didn't know this they didn't know this great contribution uh, that the Irish made to Canada so that's why today is so important but the stories aren't all happy stories with happy endings and that's really why we're here today because this park is a place that people in Ottawa need to be aware of. They need to know what happened here. They need to know what lies beneath this ground we're standing on. And that story needs to be told across Canada, but we need to start that here. So we need to build on this event today, commemorate the occasion, share the information, and so when people come into this park going forward, they know what is here and what happened here. So I'm, I'm truly honored to be part of this, and I just, I can't thank you enough for including me and uh, 
My constituents know that I'm in Ottawa to represent them, but anybody who knows me uh, personally knows that my real passion project is Ireland and Canada. So thank you very much. Thank you, James. We have, Jim Watson was, our mayor was to come today, but uh, unfortunately he cannot be here due to the funeral of Madame Giselle Lalonde, who is the one who kept Montfort Hospital for us. Um, le maire d'Ottawa, Jim Watson, ne pourrait pas être présent ce matin en raison des funérailles de Madame Giselle Lalonde, qu'on aime bien parce qu'elle nous a gardé l'hôpital Montfort. Now, we will hear from Dr. Mark McGowan, author, professor of history and Celtic studies at the University of Toronto and interim principal of the University of St. Michael's College. Dr. McGowan is renowned for his work in the Cath on the Catholic Church in Canada and the Great Irish Famine. Nous allons écouter maintenant le Dr. Mark McGowan, auteur, professeur d'histoire et d'études celtiques à l'Université de Toronto et directeur par intérim du Collège Saint Michael de l'Université de Toronto. Le Dr. McGowan est reconnu pour son travail sur l'Église catholique au Canada et sur la Grande Famine irlandaise. Dr. McGowan. You haven't heard me yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Ambassador McKee uh, and, uh, and certainly Michael McBain for uh, arranging this and their sta uh, at least the Ambassador's staff for being here in what is truly uh, resembling an Irish day here in Ottawa. Um, the last thing you need is a lecture from a professor from Toronto. There's too much air coming out of Toronto most of the time. You need less of that today, but I'm here uh, and came up yesterday uh, because I'm actually from Ottawa and uh, this is my hometown uh, and my wife is uh, a, a lay associate of the Sœur de Grise de Pembroke so I have a particular affinity and I'm so delighted to see the sisters here today uh, who have in many ways been not only during the famine but throughout the life of this city, the unsung heroes in health care uh, and in social service. And it's great to see that Michael's book has put uh, Elizabeth Briere and the sisters front and center in this struggle for survival uh, over 170 years ago. As a historian, all I can say to you is that in 1845, the Irish people never anticipated that so many would have left the country. Because when the potato blight hit in 1845, only 17 of Ireland's 32 counties were affected. This was just like something that happens periodically. We would recover, we would pick ourselves up, and we would move on. And many did. But in 1846, Ireland experienced one of the most cruel winters uh, that it had experienced in decades. And it became quite clear that the situation was to become even more dire when in the fall of 1846, the potato crop failed in almost all of the 32 counties. This was something that hadn't been experienced since the 1740s in Ireland. And it prompted that migration that became so acute in the year 1847, or as many of the Irish and the diaspora know it as, Black 47. And when you think of it, 110,000 Irish men, women and children boarded ships that were really only suited for cargo moving to Europe, not the passenger ships that one might think of in the 19th century that were operated by steam. These were sailing ships six to seven, sometimes eight weeks across the North Atlantic. Among 200, 300 people on board ship where infectious diseases like typhus spread like wildfire. And they landed at Grosil, and they landed at St. John, New Brunswick, at Partridge Island, and they landed at Middle Island in the Miramichi. They landed all over British North America. And interestingly enough, the welcoming faces that they found first as they came to what is now Quebec and Ontario were the faces of the clergy, both Anglican and Roman Catholic, 
and particularly the women religious, who often are left out of the historical record. The Sisters Hospitals of St. Joseph of Kingston, the Sœurs Grises de Montréal, the Sisters of Providence of Montreal, the Sisters of the Good Shepherd of Montreal, the clergy of Quebec, and of course the Sœurs de Charité d'Ottawa under Madame Brière, and then in Toronto by secular clergy and eventually the Loretto Sisters. As a historian and as a social historian, the stories we tell aren't just from the pulpit or from the politicians or from those who had positions of power within a society. History is here. It's below our feet. The history of ordinary people like you and like me who tried to make better in a new world on the face of catastrophe. And one of my tasks as a historian is to uncover these stories, the stories that have not been told, the stories from below, and in religious terms, the view from the pew. And so today we gather, what I say, is on sacred ground. Sacred ground to the Irish, but sacred ground to common people who lived lives and died of normally diseases that could be cured in our own time but weren't in the 1840s. And one of the important messages that I want to give to you today is that this story will be retold and continue to be told as we discover places like McDonald Park, as we discover places all along that corridor where they traveled, where one in five of these migrants in 1847 died before the end of the year. One fifth. How many burial places have we yet to discover? Our task is, is how shall we say, difficult. Prescott, Brockville, Belleville, up the Ottawa Valley, Kingston, down Lake Ontario, Coburg, Port Hope, Port Whitby, Niagara, Hamilton, in the interior. Those are the people who were buried who have no name now who have been lost to history. And one of the things that we do today is we begin that process of remembering and bringing those average, ordinary people, those Irish people, back to the pages of history. And the last thing I'd like to say to you is that when we reflect historically on this period and think of the circumstances that brought them here, hunger, disease, colonialism. These were the refugees of their time. As a historian, we have to make these things relevant to our own time. Has the plight of the refugee changed any in our own day? Are people going to bed each night in every corner of the world with full bellies? Has disease, and we know this quite well in our COVID time, been eradicated or at least treated among the very poorest of the poor? These are the questions that history begs us to continue to ask. And I'm very grateful we have an ambassador from Ireland that continues to prod and to push and to try to have us bring these questions to the fore, both for the sake of history, but for the sake of what we do in our own lives today. So my thanks to Ambassador McKee uh, and particularly to Michael McBain for this story. Many thanks to you, Dr. McGowan. Seven years ago, local author and researcher Michael McBain began researching Mother Elisabeth Bruyere. His new book, by Town, 1847, Elizabeth Bruyere and the Irish Famine Refugees highlights an incredible moment in Ottawa's history. Il y a sept ans, l'auteur et chercheur local Michael McBain a commencé ses recherches sur Mère Elizabeth Bruyere et son nouveau livre, By Town, 1847, Elizabeth Bruyer and the Irish Famine Refugees, met en lumière un moment incroyable de l'histoire d'Ottawa. Okay, uh, Michael McBain.
Thank you for coming. It's hard to keep the tears away. It's so moving. Il y a 175 ans cette année, Mère Brière, ses sœurs, les Oblats et plusieurs autres personnes ont ouvert leur cœur aux misérables Irlandais. Parlant des damnés de la terre irlandais, Elisabeth Brière a écrit en avril 1847 « Des milliers d'infortunés meurent dans les plus beaux sentiments de foi intense » d'espérance et de charité. Elisabeth Brière, les Sœurs de la Charité, ne seront jamais oubliées par les descendants landais. Cor ad cor l'acquitteur. Leur établissement de soins de santé public à Ottawa est un héritage vivant qui nous inspire à tous les... Qui, qui nous inspire tout à ouvrir nos cœurs aux malades, aux pauvres et aux réfugiés. Un mot de profond respect pour Sœur Rachel Watier, supérieure générale des Sœurs de la Charité d'Ottawa, et du Père Robert Laroche, OMI, le nouveau curé de paroisse Saint-Joseph. Merci pour vos, vos présences ici aujourd'hui. Et un grand merci à Son Excellence Eman McKeeb, ambassadeur d'Irlande au Canada, Grâce à lui, cet événement est arrivé. I just want to reflect on four paragraphs from the Bytown 1847 book, just to sketch an outline of the historical past, which explains why we're here, standing here today. The Irish refugees arrived in Bytown by the thousands in crowded barges towed by a steamboat. Bytowners had never before or since seen such famine-stricken creatures as those that descended on their town the summer of Black 47. Packed in like cattle, they had no place to lie down, little or no shelter from the elements. That summer saw heavy rains in June and temperatures of 90 degrees in July. Elizabeth Briere and her teenage novice, Marguerite Esther Cadieu, they picked up the first typhus patient to admit it to their hospital on June the 5th in 47. The patient's name was Honora Cunningham, 19 years old. She was admitted in a semi-conscious state and was so filthy that her clothes had to be cut from her. She died on the 8th. Sisters picked up 11 seriously ill immigrants covered in lice. The sisters had to be strong to carry out this work. It included lifting the bodies in pine boxes and putting them on horse carts and driving them from Briere Street today to what was the graveyard where we're standing. Sister Briere accompanied her sisters when she could to bury the dead. On July the 13th, 1847, she went with them to bury nine-year-old Anastasia Brennan. We did, not we did not risk removing all her worn clothes, Briere wrote. She gave off a foul odor when we tried. They were anxious to coffin the body and have it taken to church for a funeral before arriving at the graveyard. Her body was black as coal. I do not think that this will be the last one. A resident observing what was going on said it was not unusual to meet 15 or 20 coffins coming to this graveyard in a day. May the Irish refugees buried here rest in peace and may those who tended them, especially Elizabeth Briere, inspire us to keep our hearts open today to refugees, the sick and the poor. Thanks everyone for coming, especially Ambassador McKee, without whom this event would not have happened.
Merci beaucoup, um, Michael. So Kevin Dooley will close our ceremony now with another Irish air. Notre ceremony prendra fin avec une chanson irlandaise de Kevin Dooley. Set my touch on fire with an accursed in the street. And that's a cruel reason by me. I laughed those days. Your mother dear, God rest her soul, fell in the snow. She painted in her anguish, seeing such desolation round. She passed away from this life at you a mortal free and found a voice that spread my body in the ocean. I you were only two years old and neither was your friend. I could not leave you with my friends, for you bore your father's name. I wrapped you in my coat and wore at the dead of night and seen I leave behind you and swear goodbye to you. Oh, Father dear, today will come an answer to you. Each Irishman with feeling stern will rally once in all. I'll be the man to lead the man, me the flag of peace. We raise the cry for the Lord and I. We raise the cry for the Lord and I. And then the first thing.
Shanaya Gadekevin. A most fitting ending for our ceremony, Shan knows. Merci à vous tous pour votre présence aujourd'hui et bon retour à la maison. Many thanks to all of you for being here with us today and safe home. God of Milamaya Giva Khorja, Agashlana Waslana Walya.